name is Jose, and um, I, uh, I was raised in a Marxist-Leninist Maoist family uh, that understands intersectionality. Um, and uh, on the other hand, much of my adult life has been in anti-authoritarian uh, movements ranging from counter-globalization to, to some of the anti-militarist wings of the anti-war movement, to Occupy Wall Street, to Cop Watch. So, um, so uh, some of us in my generation have the benefit of having a lot of different uh, angles to, to this, um, this question. Uh, and I do research, I do writing, um, I've written on police abolition and other things for Rolling Stone. Uh, I do radio uh, with, uh, on BBC and, and on pad podcasts, um, and I do independent researching, but most of all, I'm uh, an activist for And? He has a, he co-wrote the article on autonomism in this issue. Hi, my name is Mark. So, uh, so again, my name is Jose, and I'll try to. I, I was very active in Occupy Wall Street, and I'll probably try to reserve any Occupy types of comments to uh, the Q and A, you know, uh, and let them control that conversation for now. Um, <laughs> But I'll talk a little bit about, I'll situate maybe the article that um, I submitted with uh, Linda to uh, Science and Society a little bit. Um, so it was, it, it's called Marxist Encounters with Anarchism. And, you know, uh, I think that a, a part of it was a frustration, and I have, you know, long had a frustration with a dogmatism and a fetishism that is endemic to both, I think, anarchist and, so, and Marxist uh, ways of thinking which I don't think are so dichotomous, right? I think that it's easier for us to make them dichotomous um, than, uh, than if we actually understand the, the historical record of strategy and organizing, um, and especially the place that we're in right now. So we kind of looked uh, uh, at the history of Marxism and of communism, and saw that there were a lot of periods of rupture. And those periods of rupture were places where other understandings of radical organizing and, and more libertarian or anti-authoritarian understandings of Marxism came about because there was suddenly a space or a frustration. There was either um, a lot more openness uh, towards struggle, sometimes in places that were very different from uh, Russia or other places. And then in other cases, there was a lot of disillusionment with uh, something that had happened in authoritarian socialism. So that is, you know, leaving the first international aside, it is the period during and after the Russian Revolution. It is, uh, it is the period where a lot of people became frustrated with Stalinism and Trotskyism um, in the late 30s. It is a period, uh, certainly when Stalin died and during the de-Stalinization period, and again in the 60s, and then again, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, in which we see branches in each of those of other attempts to formulate a Marxist politics. A Marxist politics around what some people were calling council communism and left communism in the direct and post-World War I era. And then some people resurrected that um, to try to understand what a Marxist politics could be in the 30s. And some people once again resurrected that in the 50s. Um, and in the late 40s and the 50s, what we came to was, was talking about autonomism and autonomous Marxism as one of the most interesting and one of the more influential but least understood uh, anti-authoritarian Marxisms to exist in the English-speaking world. Because it doesn't come from the English-speaking world, people less often call themselves that, but the influence is nevertheless there. So, uh, so in the in the fifties um, there were, and in the late forties there were a number of some ex Trotskyists, some people who came from simply anti-Stalinist Marxist currents, uh, and it's not just in Italy and Greece, uh, Italy and Germany, but I think that the the, the dominant um, canonical works of autonomism are often noted to have been from from uh, England and Germany and Greece and and uh, Italy. Um, but they have tried to formulate a different politics. They said the, the Leninist Party doesn't work for us in our current situation. And in some of those cases, the Leninist Party was massive. I mean, in Italy, coming out of World War II, it was very large, but very quickly turned into a, a social democratic politics around Eurocommunism. And they, and they were very frustrated with, with the limits or, or the, the, the dogmatism of Trotskyism. And they were very frustrated with Stalinism. And so they attempted to say, how do we create a worker-generated Marxism? How do we create a, a worker-generated revolutionary politics? 
And, you know, to cut it short, a lot of it was about understanding the changes in the, the working class so that it's not just an industrial proletariat in, in Western Europe at that point anymore. It's beginning to reformulate and reconstitute. And the, uh, I think autonomism had some role, but, but not a massive one in the United States, but certainly a bigger role uh, in Germany and Italy in this, coming out of the student movements of, um, wow, 10 minutes goes fast. Uh, uh, you know, coming out of the, the 60s and the, the uprisings in uh, Europe and in Japan in the 60s. So we tried to look at autonomism, something that really, really got big in the 70s and continued, and I think has a bigger impact in some ways on the politics of things like Occupy Wall Street and the counter-globalization movement, because especially coming out of the fall of the Soviet Union, people, you know, it, it's going to happen. Radical politics is going to reemerge, right? Some of it is going to emerge with the fetishism of an attempt to only look at the Spanish Civil War or statelessness or uh, uh, you know, the, the, the great icons of, and, and iconography of, of anarchism. And some of it is going to come out of the iconography or the, the, the dogmatism of people who are focused on geopolitics for so long. In the post-World War II, or in the, the post-Soviet breakup era, you can't talk about geopolitics in the same way as you could during the Soviet era. Right? And so some people in Latin America, uh, in, in Western Europe, and in many other parts of the world, I think had to reformulate an anti-capitalist politics because we no long, there was no longer a guiding force, Moscow or Beijing, to guide uh, revolutionary politics in the West or in Latin America. And, and you know, you'll find tons of Marxist parties in Africa also stopped calling themselves Marxist after this point. So radical politics in Africa also changed, especially at this point. Um, but in, in uh, Occupy Wall Street and in the counter-globalization movement, some of what happened by some sectors was an attempt to create prefigurative politics and create uh, autonomy and, and a lot of times refute the idea of national organization, which I don't think anarchism does, right, you know, all the time. I don't think that that is anarchism's prerogative or it's even its, its guiding principle to refute national or international organizing. I think autonomism engages with that a lot more because it's about not engaging in uh, trade union or parliamentary work ever. And anarchists sometimes get elected to things or certainly work for trade unions. Um, but, ref but, but saying that everything has to come from the ground up and we have to simply be uh, prefigurative examples for other groups. Which the problem with that is my understanding of prefiguration is that if you want to create models today, you also have to be engaging in, in the political struggle and the, the fight for political power, whatever that looks like, anarchist or communist, that, that, that Jackie was talking about, because you're only prefiguring once, you know, examples once we have taken power, once the workers or the 99% or the multitude or whatever we frame uh, the, the majority of the population and exploit people, um, that then we're recreating that on a, on a national or global or international scale. And autonomism, to some degree, refutes that and says we simply need to be uh, models in our local struggles, in our uh, autonomous social centers, and in our uh, anti-gentrification or immigrant rights or whatever struggles, um, anti-militarism struggles. So I think that uh, aut autonomism engaged in that to a great degree. And, and our struggles in the United States, having seen a left that had been so broken by first by McCarthyism, and then later by, by the repression of COINTELPRO in the 70s and the 80s, and then you know, later by, by uh, neoliberalization of our consciousness in, in this country, um, that it, it made sense, I think, that autonomism became a major thought. And it's not for us to simply dismiss it outright, even if we have a problem with it, right? I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, helpful for us to be um, anti-anarchist in the, the Spanish or the Greek senses either because there is a politics in that place which allows it to, to, to uh, which allows self-organization and self-organization of struggles to sometimes be autonomous in nature. On the other hand, we can't look to autonomism to bring down feudalism and monarchy in Nepal in 2006. So I don't think that it's, we have to look at every single place with a prism of either Marxism, Leninism, or anarchism, and Bakuninism, or, or whatever our anarchism is, we have to look at different cir circumstances in different places. And in the, the Americas, in the United States especially, I think that autonomism has provided um, a great degree of, of organization and a great model, at the same time as it has proven its limits 
often being an uprising and presenting a great uh, pro uh, you know, area of process and of struggle for uprisings that don't necessarily lend themselves to long-term struggle and long-term organizing. Occupy Wall Street would not have been a great thing if it had been a Marxist, by-the-numbers, revolutionary organizing uh, uh, moment where we understood how to struggle for reforms in the furtherance of revolution. It wouldn't. Right? It was an uprising that required other things, and, and people needed other things to get them off the ground. And I was also in Spain during the Indignado and Quince Emma movement, and I think the same is true there. But, the, but it, like any uprising, offers us opportunities to come out of it in anarchist or Leninist or whatever other kinds of organizing, um, and to engage in other kinds of struggle that is more long-term, that will be sustainable, because it changes the discourse, and it changes what people think is possible. So um, that's where I'll leave it for now, and uh, maybe I'll get more into that kind of question when we get to q and First of all, that last thing, I mean, I think that that's a false dichotomy. Again, I think that you don't just engage in local struggle. We do a lot of that kind of local struggle around, you know, in cities that I've lived in, Chicago and New York. You also have to confront the system and the structure and do high-profile things. And then you have to know how to be able to go back. And in many cases, uh, in New York, to a, to a certain degree, in Sunset Park and Crown Heights, um, but and, and in the Bronx, in certain parts of the South Bronx, there there were people who went back from Occupy Wall Street in the epicenter in Wall Street back to their communities. But uh, and I think in some other cities they were much better at that. But uh, really, really quickly, so so to move to the questions. I like to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld. Um, <laughs> you don't go to war with the left you would like to have or you would want to have at a later time. You go to war with the left that you have, right? And I think that we build from the left that we have. So to understand the, 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 the development of Podemos is to understand, A, that there were divisions within indi the indignado struggle of, that were, where there were occupations in about 50 different cities across Spain. And in some of those places, anarchists predominated, in other places, a different kind of politics, and in other places, a different kind of anti-authoritarian po politics like autonomism and autogestionistas, self-management uh, organizing. And from some sectors of that that had more inclination anyway towards electoral politics and towards political struggle, um, their Podemos came out, right? So I think that I think that uh, one of the things that's interesting in Germany, where I, I had written a lot in the article we wrote a lot on Germany, but now I just went to Germany for a month and saw that the autonomous movement has shifted to some degree from being so completely opposed to parliamentary politics 100% and trade union politics 100%. Now there is the autonoma um, movements that still exist, very highly local, fighting gentrification, housing struggles, immigration, racism struggles, and now there is a big wing that has become national, known as the, the, the post left, with the unfortunate name of the le uh, left, in, uh, the left interventionists or the interventionist left, which doesn't sound very good in English, but to them they are anti-authoritarians who believe that they need to have a relationship with the rest of the left, the, the electoral and parliamentary um, left. I think in, in Greece, you know, Syriza predates 2008, the big uprising there, um, but certainly got bigger after that to some degree. And, you know, so I think that what we're building here, and, you know, Rojava, I mean, we do have examples of Bookchin. Bookchin isn't just something that, you know, exists in, in books in the United States. There are Marxist Leninists and people who have some, some degree of malice politics who said, Maybe we can learn something from Bookchin and try to figure out a new uh, politics in northern Syria. Because when we talk about anarchism and Marxism, when we talk about political power, and I think that that's often the, one of the big debates between the different tendencies, uh, we don't always disagree on what political power looks like. Sometimes we agree it's the Paris Commune, or it's the Workers' Councils, or it's the, the, the confederal, it's confederalism of, uh, or the municipal, uh, whatever they call it, um, um, in, in Rojava, in northern Syria, I think that often we're fighting for the same kind of political power. We, 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 we have divisions on how to get there, or we have divisions on our names. And that doesn't help us build a left in the United States that understands 
where the working class is and the precarity of the working class, the, the low wage level of so many sections of the working class, and how to organize communities that are less and less industrialized and less and less have a mass manufacturing base, but also can't, aren't going to achieve any kind of political power out of lifestyleists hanging out in a punk scene um, all day and, and uh, being pure, right? So, so I think that to the question of horizontalism, right, like I think that horizontalism is a mistranslation because in Latin America, very few people call themselves horizontalistas, you know? It's, it's horizontality. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, what these kinds of anti-authoritarian uh, things like horizontality offer us is an aspiration that our organizing and our political power that we're trying to create should look like. It's an aspiration that we, we're not going to attain, but we should attempt to do organizing amongst workers and in our communities in anti-gentrification anti struggles or against deportation or police violence that aspires towards horizontalism and uh, horizontality and a more democratic framework so that it can actually come from people in the community. But I think that I think that we, we if we talk too much about these kinds of words and the nomenclature, I think you're exactly right. We don't talk about the politics of, of real struggle and how people are actually struggling in the United States today. And some of that is low wage struggle. And that is if that is trade unions that are furthering the low wage struggle, that's great and we need to get behind that. Period. And on the other hand, if it is uh, if it is you know, a, a slew of anti-authoritarian black politics that is doing really amazing work in Black Lives Matter, we need to get behind that and fight, f you know, against police violence and I would say fight to abolish the police and prisons um, in a struggle, you know, that is currently happening right now, not aspire towards some kind of organization that is Leninist, Maoist, anarcho-syndicalist that doesn't presently exist, right? We can, we can try to move the, the, the actual movements in those directions, but we have to look where people are right now and where the momentum is and where the struggle is and then formulate our struggle out of what currently is. Uh, okay, so a, a few, uh, two quick points and then one longer one. On the question of the, the idea that there's multiple Marxisms, I think that it's, it's a good point and it's a salient point in an age of you know, Syriza Podemos, uh, the KPD of Germany versus Dielinka, the, the you know, all these various parties. That there is there is such a thing as a Marxist party that's not Leninist, and I think that we need. I think that we need. I think Lenin is a great revolutionary influence that we should study. But I think that Leninism has had its day, and that there is a possibility for a Marxist politics and for Marxist party making that is not Leninist, um, and we need to think about that. Right now, that predates Mark Lenin, that was during Lenin, that was after Lenin, who was fighting you know, an authoritarian feudal regime in completely different circumstances than we're fighting in the United States today. Um, uh, the, the next quick thing is, I forgot almost to say that this, this, this conversation that's happened about anarchism is better equipped to talk about oppressions. Uh, is, I think it's interesting in lieu of the history of uh, the great uh, feminist and black and Latino and Latin American and African and Asian thought and indigenous thought that comes out of Marxism to talk about a pre racial, national, gender oppression, right? So that if we look at CLR James and Selma James, if we look at Simone de Beauvoir um, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, France Fanon and Amilcar Cabral and any number of some of the most important theorists whose theory is still applicable and relevant to questions of race, nation, and gender, and intersectionality, the, this comes out of Marxist thought, right? So I don't, you know, I think that, I think that that was, I just wanted to set the record straight that anarchism didn't get it right. We often have to look to communists, including Maoists, to find it. Um, but on the question of class analysis of, of, of anarchists, for one thing, who does the interesting class politics and class interrogative work. And this is one of the things that makes me interested in autonomism. I think that there was a lot of anti-authoritarian Marxist groups that said that the, the, the working class looks different. We have to talk about the working class. We have to talk about it as a context of ownership and power relations, not a conversation about income level. And I think that if we talk about the 99% too much, and we refuse to talk about the class coalition that that 
looks like in one of our parks or in our organizing, then we're only talking about income, we're talking about symptom. And when we fall into liberalism, we don't have a real radical politics um, that understands ownership and power. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I think that the problem of making the assumption that we understand a class analysis is A, the class has changed. And the relationship between class, race, nation, and gender has always been, you know, complex and has been changing. And so having a class analysis doesn't mean that you have a full class analysis or a contemporary class analysis or a strategy around having a full or contemporary class analysis. And I think the problem of, of, of anarchism and, and a lot of anti-authoritarianism in the West is that if we claim to assume that Marxism is, a, is generally authoritarian, but we all have the same class analysis, it allows us on one side to be in academia and to really get our stuff perfect in academia outside of the sphere of real politics and of practice. And on the other side, to have people in the streets who are doing really important organizing or the organizing of today in, you know, anywhere in Western Europe or the United States or in certain parts of, like, Brazil, um, that is dissociated from theory and becomes anti-intellectual. And, it, you know, I think that it breaks the, the dialectical relationship of theory and practice. We have to continue to talk about the theory. We have to understand the theory. We also have to understand that the theory is developed long past Marxism before we, we make an assumption that we simply all agree on. Because making the assumption leaves a lot of, uh, in my experience over the last 16 years, it leaves a lot of people fighting in radical queer movements and Occupy Wall Street and counter-globalization movement, the immigrant rights movement, the anti-war movement, anti-cop movements, and so many others, uh, having a language that came from academia or, or from radical organizing, but not knowing where the language came from or what it truly means and then fighting over language in the streets without the, the theory that is relevant to it and without understanding how language should, you know, was meant to be applied to the practical situation. And on the other hand, people creating language in academia completely not understanding where the world's politics are, where the, the, where the struggle is, where the momentum for resistance is, whether that's Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter. It makes it easy to dismiss Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street or to dismiss the Indignado movement or the or Antarsia, the extra parliamentary left of Greece, rather than you know actually contend with what's the relationship between those fighting for political power, whatever that looks like, and the struggle on the bottom. Um, so you know I think that sometimes we have to name it. That's, that's okay. sure. um, so the question of Marx is that good? Uh, all right. Well, first of all, um, I you know first of all when it comes to the question of like. Stalin and, you know, fighting World War II, I just want to really quickly say, I think it's great to have an honest interpretation of history, but otherwise leave that shit behind, yes. right? Because the, it, it, we have to be honest about how World War II was won if we're historians, um, and, you know, how fucked up Stalin was if we're historians, but otherwise we need to figure out how to prevent fascism today. And that's not in the United States, but that's true in Europe and in certain parts of Latin America. They have to have an honest analysis of how to fight fascism. And if there's lessons to glean from something that happened 80 years ago, 90 years ago, then there's lessons to glean. And if the, the situation is too different, we have to be, you know, it, it's very simple. The situation is just too different. And I think that the situation is just too, I, I never say we should dispense with Lenin. Uh, I certainly have the collected works over my bed. But, <laughs> yeah, no, I've been waiting for the avalanche, the vagrant is but like, but the, but the reality is that I think Lenin and Leninism are two separate things, and the United States does not look like Russia before the Soviet Union. It doesn't, right? I think that it is, it is, it, we should understand that Lenin said scientifically, let's try to figure out how to make a revolution in Russia in 1905, 1910, 1917. And we have to look at how to make a revolution here today, which is a completely different conversation, regardless of if we think that the bourgeois Democrats versus the bourgeois Republicans is a new form of dictatorship of the markets or whatever. But I think that, uh, so to, hopefully to get back to, the, to, to today, which I think is more important to some degree than you know, amazing stuff that happened or terrible stuff that happened in Stalinist Russia or Tsarist Russia. Um, we're too small. The left is too small. It is too marginal for us to, to be too obsessed with our divisions and our distinctions. 
in places like Brazil, Germany, and Greece, sometimes people realize that. And they say, we have to fight our local struggle, as well as our national and international struggle. Our struggle around questions of policing, deportation, housing, space, and labor, as well as our national and international questions of labor, imperialism, and militarism, um, together. Because right now, there's not, you know, with certain exceptions, right now there is not a counterbalance to that. Uh -oh. It's a flood warning. Okay, all right. So, so, so what, what happens is, I think, is that we, in Brazil, a lot of times what some of the anti-authoritarian left and the PT, uh, who is the ruling party now, and the Trotskyist left, have understood is that they need to fight together while they are still together. And when one of them achieves enough power, achieves a critical mass enough maybe to, to be elected into government, they can be traitors to the rest of the left. But allow the, but we have to organize first together to get to those schisms. We're not at a place where we have time or energy to sit around debating our schisms. We need to organize together, whether that is on struggles of Fight for 15, or occasionally maybe to get Kashama Sawan elected, or to, to fight cops in the streets, or to find, you know, to organize to abolish prisons, or to, you know, whatever the struggles are, locally and nationally and internationally, we need to work together until we can no longer work together and the contradictions are sharpened. So, uh, first, thank you so much for bringing up the modern school in Ferrer. Um, uh -huh. Yes. Uh, I'm presenting at the reunion of the Modern School at Rutgers in September, so I'll see you.